Small compact things are great. They take up less room, easier to lift and move around, usually are a bit cheaper, eat less food, use less energy, and you're not necessarily getting something of lower quality. Hi, my name is David Cutter. I recently started this channel as a method to explore and share my experiences and thoughts on home audio, music, and other related topics. This channel, My Own Devices, just recently marked its 500th subscriber, and I would like to personally thank each person who has watched, liked, left comments, or even subscribed. So if you enjoy this video and would like to catch each new one, please subscribe. Hey, click the little bell and receive an alert each time I post a new one. I like reading your comments, and I make the effort to reply to each one. So thanks for me, and let's get on with the video. There are obvious compromises when you buy smaller things. A smaller house or car may be a bit tight for some families. But from my experience, a lot of people buy houses and cars that are much larger than what they actually need. One aspect of this is the belief that you need more watts on your amplifiers, that more watts always sounds better. But once you've been an enthusiast long enough, you learn that the actual amount of watts your system needs and uses is significantly lower than what your amp can deliver. Loudspeakers fall into this category as well. Massive speakers can be very impressive to hear and behold. And this is really where the rubber hits the road when it comes to the perception of value per dollar. Now, bigger speakers often will produce deeper bass. I've had some larger speakers that have had rather weak bass for their size, and I've had some the opposite, some smaller speakers that had surprisingly full and rich bass. Now, I've owned a few larger loudspeakers in my time, and I've generally been very happy with them. One of the aha moments I had not that long ago is that I noticed that my larger speakers sounded better when I was standing out side the room in the in the foyer outside my my office than they sounded when i was inside the room you know bass waves low frequency waves need room to stretch out for you to hear them properly and if the room is too small you're not going to hear them now i i love my big speakers and i tried moving them to a larger room in the house to the family room but uh, if you watch my previous video about the wife acceptance factor, you know what happened there. I'll put a link above about that. Here is my collection of small, compact speakers. I decided to compare them head to head and to see which ones I like best. I've owned one pair of speakers since I bought them new in 1997. The rest were acquired over the past year. And I don't own any ultra high-end gear. I work mostly with used, good quality stuff within a modest budget. The digital music source I'm using is through a first-generation iPad Pro and Tidal Streaming through an AudioQuest, Dragonfly, Black, and a Jitterbug connected. Although I have a number of components to choose from, I decided to keep it really simple. The amplification is a vintage 75 watt per channel Nakamichi receiver. Its unique feature is the stasis amplifier stage designed by famed engineer Nelson Pass of Threshold. It was recently serviced and partially recapped and I'm very impressed with its sound quality. These receivers are renowned for their clarity and low frequency control. I set them up in a smallish carpeted bedroom and listened to a selection of tracks as I took copious notes. Now I'm going to have a listen to these shiny Martin Logan Motion 35 XTs. And that's a mouthful. I've only owned these a few weeks and I'm interested to see how they compare. They get nice reviews and look impressive. They have folded ribbon tweeters and six and a half inch aluminum woofers. Check out the beautiful glossy cherry cabinets that exude quality. Even the binding posts are impressive. Starting out with the Fascinating Rhythm instrumental track by Dave Grusin, I noticed that the bass response was fairly tuneful but not very deep. The lead instruments are vibraphones and piano, and they sound quite pronounced and forward. They actually occasionally hit 
high resonating notes that were irritating to my ears. Uh, the snare drum and cymbals were very crisp and detailed, and I'm assuming the folded ribbon tweeter is responsible for the extended high frequencies. During the guitar intro to Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven, a song I've literally listened to thousands of times, I noticed atmospheric sonic details like Jimmy Page's fingers plucking and sliding along the fretboard that I've never heard before. I was stunned. These speakers especially shine on acoustic and vocal tracks. Nils Lofgren's live Keith Don't Go was incredibly engaging to listen to as well. However, Artists with high-pitched voices like Grimes on Kill v. Maine and the electric guitar solos on Like a Hurricane by Neil Young were very unpleasant for me to listen to. There was a pronounced upper mid-range glare that I could not handle for an extended period of time. I tried them in a near-field arrangement and I thought they sounded shrill with little or no bass. I had to move them further away to sound halfway decent. What are their strengths? Well, they're revealing and they are very airy sounding. They have good instrument separation, good imaging, and moderate dynamics and drama. However, their weaknesses are that I found the upper mid-range glare on certain tracks to be unbearable for extended periods of listening. I'm thinking that Martin Logan designed these to be used in a home theater system with a subwoofer, so they, so they didn't even try to give them sufficient low frequency response. Next speaker to review, these Paradigm Mini Monitors. These compact boxes are still a highly regarded and popular speaker from the 1990s, so popular that Paradigm updated them six more times. They feature a 1-inch titanium tweeter and a 6.5-inch polypropylene woofer. I noticed that the bass is particularly full and warm sounding on these. However, I wouldn't describe it as particularly tight or super well controlled, but you can definitely feel it. Mid-range frequencies are warm and pleasant, much more relaxed presentation compared to the Martin Logans, less edge, zero glare due to a more subdued upper mid-range frequency response. Camille Thurman's A Change of Mind was so natural and relaxed sounding, her wonderful singing and sax playing just oozed out of the speakers, and the cymbal work of the drummer just shimmered really nicely as well. High frequencies were smooth and detailed, no harshness, but less defined than the Martin Logans. Now these are great speakers for rock music. Judas Priest's Victim of Changes just chugged along wonderfully. Neil Young's Like a Hurricane just fit together as a single unit and rocked. There's definitely less instrument separation, but sometimes you just want that. These are not particularly revealing speakers. You're not going to say, hmm, I never noticed there's a tambourine on this song. They're very good in a near field and home theater setup. I've used them in both. Their strengths are they have a respectable bass response that's deceptively good considering their size. They rock and have a pleasing overall smooth tone and presentation. They're crowd pleasing overall. No one is going to say they suck. Listing their weaknesses, I would say the bass is full, but a bit ill-defined. There's plenty of it, but it's just a bit loose. I would not say their treble response is revealing or clinical as some others in this review. So I would describe them as a bit laid back in comparison. Now let's take a look at these Dynaco A25s. These speakers have been a favorite of audio enthusiasts since they came out in 1968. It's estimated that Dynaco sold over a half a million pairs of these models during their long run. They were and remain excellent value compact speakers. These were considered a bookshelf design 50 years ago they're equipped with an 8 inch paper woofer and a 1 and a quarter inch dome tweeter. This unusual type of port, with fiberglass restricting the airflow of, or sound waves from the rectangular vents, is called aperiodic loading. It's neither a bass reflex or acoustic suspension design. This is said to improve control over the bass response and make them easier to drive. In comparison to the paradigms, they're a bit bass light on the lowest notes, but they're not lacking useful and tuneful bass. And it's pleasant and well managed. 
The best part is the mid-range and higher frequencies. I went to a beautiful vocal and piano jazz track by Shirley Horn titled May the Music Never End that I recently discovered. Now Shirley Horn had a mature and emotionally moving voice that was amazingly clear. The A25s expressed her vocal qualities and the piano beautifully and elegantly. The excellent CS tweeters do not appear to show their age at all and hold their own against modern designs. Vocals sound more lifelike and open compared to the Paradigm Mini monitors. Do they rock? Yes, they do. They don't pound away quite as well or convincingly as the Mini monitors, but they give it all they got, which is enough for me. Not Fragile by BTO or Bachman Turner Overdrive was given mad respect by these old timers. I would say that they are pretty neutral sounding without noticeable offensive coloration. They don't sound boxy or closed in. On the contrary, they possessed a very clear, enjoyable, cohesive tone. No glaring weaknesses here. Perhaps a touch bass light considering their larger size. I attribute that to their unique front ported design. And the bass does improve when you move them closer to the wall. Dynamics are decent, but not among the best in the group. I would describe them as more even-handed. The A25s are not heavy, but big for a bookshelf speaker by today's standards. Their looks are a bit dated as well, but I personally like the mid-century looks. And finally, let's consider these KEF Q150s. They're so cute. These KEF entry-level models came out in 2018 and they feature their latest version of the UniQ driver. The woofer and tweeter are a single unit with the high frequencies emanating from the center mounted tweeter. These have been my so-called daily drivers for a couple months and I've been curious to see how they stack up. I made a video about them recently and I'll put a link above. These are the smallest of the group and they have an aluminum five and a quarter inch woofer and one inch tweeters. Right off the bat, I can hear on fascinating rhythm that they produce the deepest bass response of the group. This is somewhat surprising considering their diminutive dimensions. The low frequencies are tight, they dig deceptively deep, and are tuneful. Mid-range is balanced and integrated. Treble is airy, light, and articulate, with very little shrillness. On the band Dave's True Stories album, Like a Rock, the Q150s express the closely mic stand-up bass amazingly well. This is a wonderfully recorded track and these speakers really describe each instrument and the female singer in tremendous detail, as well as the air inside the studio. It is breathtaking. The soundstage and imaging are excellent. The music fills the room and they sound so much bigger than they are. I like to close my eyes or turn out the lights at some point while evaluating speakers. And these actually sound like they could be the largest of the group. They come alive with the volume cranked up and they have the best dynamics of the bunch. Do these rock? Yes, to a degree. I put on Hooch and Going Blind by Melvins, a couple of the heaviest 1990s grunge tracks I know, and they did fine. Are they as good as the mini monitors for that? Uh, no, they, but they were fine. They sounded like they were trying to articulate in each instrument when it would have been better to just pour the music out into the room like a dump truck full of rocks. Where else do they fall short? Well, they don't entirely disappear like some bookshelf loudspeakers. Obviously, Kef had to cut some corners when making entry-level models, and that's what they likely did with these cabinets. They are well finished and are braced inside, but they do produce a resonance that is not present in the more similarly sized LS50s and their reference line. Their high frequencies are not as extended and etched like they are in the Martin Logans, but I think I prefer a slightly more rolled off, smoother sound. Early on after I got them, I connected them to a small sub, assuming they needed some bass reinforcement. But you know, after this evaluation, I turned off the sub and I'm pretty satisfied with how they sound. These are all good quality speakers, and they all have their fans. My ranking is simply based on this particular evaluation under the conditions I described. Please don't go after me suggesting room treatments, crossover mods, different cables, and amplifier matching. 
Someone even suggested I pull the Martin Logan three feet away from the front wall. That's simply not going to work in my situation. The Martin Logans are beautifully made and finished. They have amazing tweeters, great imaging, but they have lackluster base and I just couldn't get past that annoying upper mid-range glare. The Paradigm Mini Monitors have great bass punch, go deep for their size. They're great for rocking out. Now they sound a bit closed in and small sometimes, and the upper frequencies lack some clarity and openness. The Dynacos were the surprise at second place. They have a very open and natural tone to them. They're more hi-fi sounding than the Mini Monitors. They're great with vocals and have a nice walnut veneer and vintage retro look but they do lack a bit of deep bass for their considerably larger size. The Q150s are the best balanced of the four, with no real glaring weaknesses. The bass midrange and treble are superbly integrated and cohesive. They have superior imaging and dynamics, and they just sound right to my ears. I can listen to them all day. They can almost rock with the paradigms, and I forgot to mention earlier, they're perfect for near field listening. On the downside, they sound mildly boxy and may not hold it together if you push them too hard. I know plenty of people who will never give up their big speakers. Obviously, it's their choice to get the biggest speakers they can afford and fit into their listening room. And if it's all about volume and bass, that's fine. It's my belief, though, that many enthusiasts have speakers that are a bit too big for the listening room and they would benefit tremendously by going a bit smaller. This is something I've learned from experience, and I believe that by going smaller, I've definitely improved my listening enjoyment. It, listen, if I had a larger, more spacious listening room, I would definitely go bigger. But as it is, I'm happy with what I've got. 